Welcome. Here we are again. Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Well, just before I went there. For another lesson from our fundamentals of the faith. Let us first start with our prayer. Dear Lord, we believe and trust your word. We want to grow in you more each day and to understand your promises for us. We commit our time together to you and ask that you heal and restore us as we dive into your word. Help us to learn, to understand, and to apply your word each day. We ask for a deeper faith. We ask to meet with you and to be better. So today, help us as we read your word in the scriptures. Amen. We're just uh, doing a little discussing on things coming. Uh, this might go too hard tonight. So Dave's going to keep an eye on the time. And if it's looking that way, then we'll stop uh, a little early and finish it up next week, which of course will push uh, the, you know, the, next, uh, the second part of this to that next week. And then Dave's number 12 lesson will show up and then. 13. But the first week of July is our retreat. So there will be no Bible study that week. So that'll push us probably second, third week in the July or finish. But that's all right. Gives us more time to put things together. I want to use the time at the uh, retreat to set up stuff to go through for the future. All right. So Tonight, we have lesson 11. Let's see if this works. Nope. There we go. That one. Okay. Uh, what we have is evangelism. A very interesting topic. A lot more in depth than I have suspected. Uh, I know what evangelism is, but uh, did not know it went this deep. Never thought about it. Uh, Pastor MacArthur <laughs> entitles it Fishing of Men. And I think you'll see very clearly why. We look at Matthew 4, 18 22. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 22. Jesus calls his first apostles. These are the first individuals that he calls to form his group, to begin his ministry. Jesus comes across two fishermen along the Sea of Galilee. He calls out to Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. You know the story, I'm, I'm sure, from Sunday school, maybe other uh, times you've read or heard it in Matthew. Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Uh, I like that. I like uh, the fact that. Uh, Testament goes and points this out that uh, this is a, a perfect metaphor, but also the truth. These are fishermen. He's talking to the first two. The first two people he chooses are fishermen. This third and fourth person, the next two, are also so they know how to fish. So they have a, a good basic understanding of what will be coming. Both men immediately left their nets and followed Jesus. Talk more about their being chosen. Going on from there, Jesus saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. So we have two brothers. They were in a boat with their father, mending nets, which is one of the things that fishermen spend a lot of time doing. Even ones that just have the small cast nets, you're always having to repair them. He called them, and they both left the boat and their father and followed him. Matthew chapter 4, verse 21 22. Life saving story. 
Pastor MacArthur has this in the very beginning of the sermon that goes along with, I thought it was pretty cool, but it, it, it makes a lot of sense when, when you listen to it. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to try and hit high points just to get you an idea of what's going on. But he says that it was some years back, but he was reading the Presbyterian Journal, which I find kind of interesting. But, and he read this parable. <clears throat> On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life saving station. Now, the United States alone has three coasts the east, the west, and the south. And Florida happens to have the east and the south. Both of them, nobody else, no other state has that. But we do. Okay. And yes, uh, well, there were, well, Key, the city of Key West actually came about because of shipwrecks and the people that would go out and maybe pick up some people that were alive, but most of the time they went out to uh, get what was on the ships. Uh, what was it called? Uh, this word for the, that I can't even bring up my mind uh, for some reason. Uh, anyway. Uh, <coughs> So that's that's Key West. And, and the shoals along the east side of Florida and down in the Key West South are Virginia. pretty bad. Uh, but up in the northeast, uh, the New England states, there's a lot of shipwrecks in that area and a lot of this. And then some on uh, the west coast. It didn't come along quite as early. But uh, you did have these. They started out first as volunteer. Uh, probably from the Salvage, that's it. Salvage, salvage the operations. Word. These lifeboat stations probably came about from the salvage operation because some people thought lives were a little bit more important. Oops. Just with that. I'm going to knock that off. Okay. So, uh, it was a crude little life station. Uh, it was just a hut, basically. One boat, few devoted members. They kept a constant watch over the sea. Uh, they would work in groups because they still had to maintain a job, which you know, took up a lot of the time. So, uh, they would, uh, they would watch over the sea, uh, with no thought for themselves. They went out day and night, tirelessly searching for the lost. There were many lives saved. So the little life-saving station became famous. And there were a lot of those. And they actually came into being taken over by the government and called the life-saving service. Along, and then in 1915, along with that and the lighthouse service, they became the United States Coast Guard, the Revenue Cutter. Something I know something about. Some of those who were saved and uh, various others in the surrounding area wanted to become associated with this. Uh, a lot of the people had, you know, a desire to help. <coughs> Others had other desires and interests, but that's human nature. But these people wanted to give of their time and their money and their effort to support this work. New boats were bought. A new life-saving crew was trained. The life-saving station grew. Some of the members of the life-saving station were unhappy. Uh, as is with any organization, especially volunteer. They were unhappy that the building uh, was uh, was uh, crude and you know poorly equipped. So they felt that they needed a more comfortable place. So they replaced the emergency cots and the beds and put 
put better furniture in the uh, enlarged building that they added on. And so now this station, this life-saving station, became a popular gathering, a place for its members. It was decorated beautifully, furnished exquisitely. And they kind of used it as a club. A uh, few members were now interested in going to see. So to make up for that loss of manpower, they had some money and they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. There were large ships that were wrecked off the coast. But the hired crews brought in loads of cold, wet, half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick. And some of them were black. And some of them had yellow skin. So now this beautiful new club just messed up because you've got these people trudging through the seawater Riding on land and the dirt, the sand, the mud, the seaweed. And so uh, so so yeah, so it was uh, uh, it was kind of getting unpleasant. Okay. Uh, things got messed up. Property uh, committee decided that they had to put in a, a shower house so they could uh, outside of the main building so that the people could be directed in there and showered down and cleaned up before uh, they were brought into the club. The next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members, they wanted to stop the club's life saving activities completely. It was unpleasant. It was a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some of the members insisted upon life saving as their primary purpose, which obviously it was or had been. But they were still called a life saving, and they were still called a life saving station. But they were finally voted down. And so those individuals left, went down the coast a ways. Started up a new life saving station. Of course, as the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes. Uh, that's the human condition. It evolved into a club. Yet another life saving station was founded. If you visit the coast today, you won't find any more life saving stations. You might find lifeguards, but those are on beaches with lifeguard personnel. You won't find the life saving stations anymore because you have Coast Guard stations all around the coast. And uh, any life saving needs to be done goes out of those stations by boat. But you will find in their place today many exclusive clubs along the shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in the waters, but most of those people drown. Now, this is a very simple and striking illustration of the history of the church. It amazes me there are certain churches that are just absolutely fabulous at breaking churches apart. It is amazing to me sometimes. But the work of life saving and the work of evangelism is nonetheless purest and the truest and the noblest and the most essential work of the church that, that the church will ever do. So the work of evangelism, the work of fishing men, as it were, out of the sea of sin. I, I think that's an outstanding parable. Same, I can tell you the same thing uh, occurs with volunteer fire service all over the United States. And about 80 to 85% of the fire departments in this country are volunteers which means they don't get paid or just very little to pay for gas or something like that. And there have been many 
of those departments that, that became a social club. I know for a fact of three fire departments in Manatee County that were originally volunteer and had their own bar, their own beer kegs with taps, and they had their meetings and then they'd have their beer time or their drink. Uh, card games would be played different hours on the weekends at night. So they were a club and those same problems happened to them that did here. Members would get upset and say, this isn't our purpose. All of that is gone in that county. That's not around us. Anyway. As I was saying there at the end that uh, the fire departments uh, in, in my county have all got rid of that stuff and there are still volunteers around but most of the department, most of the stages have full time today. And, and this is still the case in a lot of places but there are still some smaller places like up in the center of the state uh i know a station that was like that and they had some problems the person i knew went to join them after moving up there decided they had too many problems and they didn't want to be involved so anyway it's a parable about the church because this is the same thing that happens to the church. There are many stories I could go through and tell you about that, but I haven't got time. So uh, I know for certain we won't get uh, all the way. All right. Uh, give me a click. Uh, this is the beginning of God's plan for the redemption of the lost human beings. Luke. Chapter 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Uh, we are sinful and must pay the price for that sinful nature. You've heard this before, I'm sure, but let's just say it again here just so we remember that for the wages of sin is death. <coughs> that is found in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The price is death. All right? God put into place a plan, a perfect plan, for our sin to be paid for by Christ. Because if we pay that price, we would not exist at all and would never get time. He bore our sins, Christ, and endured our punishment. He was crucified on the cross. An innocent lamb, sacrificed on the cross for our sins. When God resurrected Christ on the third day, our sins were paid for. A couple of things I want to point out there. Number one, the innocent lamb sacrificed. The Jews were told by God in the Old Testament, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. There are this information in there on uh, sacrifices okay, that are required. Simple sacrifices for forgetting to take out the garbage up to very bad sinful things. Okay. And God had that whole thing set up. A dove was the least that a person could sacrifice. Uh, the highest would probably be steer cattle. But a lamb was sacrificed as a sin offer. Okay? If your sins were bad, you would buy a lamb, unblemished, and present it to the priest to slaughter and to give a sacrifice. They would burn parts of it. 
but not all of it. The rest would be used for food for them because they didn't have jobs, therefore they had no money, supposedly, and were unable to buy food. So that's how that worked out. That's how God worked out that plan. Okay. So the ten percent that you brought in was the ten percent of your produce. If you made wine, you brought in ten percent of your wine. If you brought if you made beers, you brought in ten percent of your beer. If you had sheep, ten percent. Cattle, corn, oats, to make the difference what it was, whatever it was you produced, you brought in. A certain amount was sacrificed, the rest was put into the storage for the priests so that they could eat. Okay. Also, pay attention to that on the third day. I don't know if I'll get to that, or maybe I'll try it in a little while. Anyway, it's very important. I want to say something about that that most people don't think about. Okay. First uh, Peter chapter two, verse twenty-four says, "He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness." For by his wounds, you were healed. Yes, we were. Remember, in one of our lessons, we talked about Christ was a substitution for us. Just as a substitute teacher, substitute to replace your teacher. Same thing, substitution. However, that does not cleanse us for eternal life. That requires us to make a choice between two directions. We are called to choose the small gate or the wide gate. Are you familiar with this story? You should be. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. I say it because that's too hard. They don't want to do that. So they take the simple one. Okay? But I do like the way that's worded. Someone brought that up sometime, or I read it or something. But they said, you know what? Uh, it's a good thing that few choose the narrow gate, and many choose why because when the time comes the road to heaven for those of us who are saved is not going to be congested like Florida is all the time I think that would be a good thing after I live in Florida the narrow gate is right before us it's not hidden Okay, it's out there in plain sight. The catch is simple. You, you, me, us, you, must decide to accept that narrow gate by confessing your sins. Then, by asking for forgiveness of those sins, thereby repenting of your sins and finally accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You must make that decision. No one else can do it. Your parents can't do it for you. This isn't the Catholic Church where they have something where you, mm -hmm. yeah, you, you can you can <clears throat> add some stuff or buy some stuff and try and buy a person's way into heaven. It doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. Okay, it does not. No one can get and make that decision for you. No one can do it for you, period. God gave us free will. And God expects us to use that free will to choose the right path. However, not everybody does. We learned a lesson nine that the Holy Spirit will enter into our body and make us part of the body of Christ. Jesus is the body of the universal church, and we fill the pews of that church as one body. Pastor MacArthur points out that the great concern of God is evangelism. The great concern of Christ is evangelism. The great concern of the Holy Spirit is evangelism. Because without evangelism, Christianity would not exist. 
through evangelism, we are a, we are to help the lost to find the narrow gate to salvation so that they can be saved. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30 says, he that winneth souls is wise. In Proverbs, the word wise is a synonym for righteous living. Now, in case you're like me and don't care for English grammar, let me just say that a synonym is a word or phrase that by association is held to embody something like quality. Here in Webster's addiction. The word wise is a synonym for righteous living. As the professor states, the truly righteous person, the person who really lives with understanding, the person who doesn't just know, but lives it out, is the one who wins soul. He is truly one. The term evangelize is a Greek term that is used 53 times in the New Testament. Not in the Old Testament. Jews don't evangelize. It is all summarized in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit the Trinity, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. We see here that evangelism is a command to us to go out and save God's flock so they can become a part of the body of the church, Christ's body and go and bring others and others and even more to God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. It's a command. Okay. We who are in the world shall, it is a command, be witness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To win, you must first lose. You must lose or give up the world in order to evangelize the gospel and bring many to repentance and salvation. It might cause us to lose our own life in order to gain one. Evangelism is a sacrifice of the greater good for the lesser. We must go out, as Pastor MacArthur states, and be a live saving, be a life-saving crew, not a club. Ministry of Jesus begins here in Matthew, chapter 4, verse 12 to 25. This is the beginning of the Christian faith. They were still Jews or Gentiles. They became followers of the way. That's what Christians were originally called. They didn't become Christians until after they left Judaism. I'm trying to remember, I think it's around 100. Maybe I think I have to look that up again. I, I know I I know of it, but I don't remember right at the moment. But anyway, in verse seventeen, Jesus began his, began his ministry when he proclaimed, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." So this is after he was baptized by John the Baptist, and the Spirit of the Lord. Send it upon him. Galilee is the home of Gentiles, and those were not Jews. Remember that Christ's own, the Jews, did not listen. They did not believe. The Gentiles were open and had the potential to receive the message. Jesus called upon the twelve to set in motion the plan that God proclaimed. They were each chosen for a reason. 
We know how seven were brought into God's service. We are not told how five began their service. The Bible has many stories about individuals who were chosen for a specific purpose. I'm sure you can name a few. Moses, Abraham, David, Isaac, tons of names. Philip, no book with them. They had a choice. They were chosen for a specific purpose, but they had a choice. To accept God's request or to reject it. Yes, that is correct. I know. The ones that we know that we listed that did not reject. But they could have. No one, none of them were made to take part. Does not mean that they had to do it. God already knew they would because he's in the future. But any one of them could have rejected the call. I remember uh, a conversation one time where uh, so that everyone is chosen uh, for heaven. Uh, and God does want everyone. But let's look back at history here, folks. God wants everyone. Genghis Khan, Hitler, Mao, Stalin, Lenin, Kim Jong-un, Shall I continue? They rejected. Okay? They're not Christians. They rejected. So, yes, you can reject. Of course, I was told it was wrong, but not. I could be wrong. God wants everyone, but not everyone chooses. It is the same for salvation. You do not have to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Jesus has given you a choice. He will not make you do it. God has never made anyone do anything. Okay? The individuals chose to participate. They chose to do as God has. God did not make them. He will not make you do it either. Being chosen for a task does not mean you have to accept. All are invited to take the narrow gate. But of course, and they are going to accept the wider date because it is easier. In Isaiah chapter 49, God says, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. He chose the Jews as his own. He made a covenant with them. He chose them. They accept it. However, along the way, he had to renew that covenant three more times. Right off the bat, when they had the covenant, they backslided. That's why the Ten Commandments were broken. Why is this? Because they lost their way. They reverted back to pagan worship and denied God. They were punished. They returned to the fold. He chose them. But it did not stop them from straying off the road to the narrow gate. You can be chosen. But as human beings, you can still deny the invitation. It's not an idea, but you can. In Mark chapter 3, verse 14, Mark says, He appointed 12 that they should be with him 
that he might send them forth to preach and cast out demons. That was cool. This is where they were officially apostles. They also gained miraculous power to do miracles. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 through 7. And when he had called to him those 12, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and disease. And he told them all how to heal all manner of sickness and diseases. In verse 7, he said, go. And he told them all how to go. And he sent them out. See, he doesn't just send you. He helps you be able to accomplish the job. As sheep in the, uh, and in verse 16, he said, as sheep in the midst of wolves. And they went to free. Notice that Jesus did not pick any priest, nor any Pharisee, any ancient sect that followed strict observance of the traditional and written law, commonly held to have pretensions to superior sanctity. They thought they were better than anybody else. Or the Sadducees, or members of a Jewish sect like a political party that denied the resurrection of the dead, the existence of spirits, and the obligation of oral tradition, emphasizing acceptance of the written work, written law alone. Now they, they said if you just followed the written law, you were fine. No. Nope. Instead, Jesus chose fishermen. Because they four. A tax collector. Ordinary working class people. Not the wealthy. Except for Matthew. Now, he was a tax collector. He did have money. And more than likely, he could, he could read and write. Because you can't keep records on taxes if you don't read and write. They were all called for a certain strength or weakness. Jesus called them each according to God's plan. As far as the fishermen are concerned, there are three qualities that fishermen have. One, patience. They can wait. Because sometimes they do for a long time before they find the fish or they get them in the nets or they hook them or whatever. Number two, perseverance. They never stop. You ever watch Deadliest Catch? Right here, right here in front of you. They were patient. They persevered. They had the courage to go out on the ocean. Really? A crew of human beings in a small boat on the vast ocean? Uh, there's a few other things I could say besides courage, but we'll leave it at that. A good fisherman also has an eye for the right moment. They will also keep out of the sight so the fish do not see them. I kind of thought that was funny. Something you know from the kid when right? he was told as a kid. Good evangelists will do the same. Keep their gaze fixed on Jesus Christ. That's where it should be. Take a moment to look at the 12 apostles. I just check something here for a second and just figure out when I need to. Okay. Uh, well, this is right here is about halfway, but got a little bit more time. Couple more minutes. Yes, so we're always talking. All right. So the first four apostles are Simon, who was called Peter, a fisherman. Andrew, the brother of Simon, a fisherman. What makes sense? 
James, the son of Zebedee, a fisher. John, the brother of James, a fisher. Now the remaining eight. We have Philip. No information about the remaining eight apostles. Uh, uh, that's available as to you know, what they did or how Jesus chose them, how he came across them. Uh, there are many information. Bartholomew, who was also known as Nathaniel. There was Matthew, a tax collector. There was Nathaniel, but he was a different person than number six. It's not the same. So one was called Bartholomew, one was called Nathaniel. Thomas, he was a twin. James, he was the cousin of Jesus. Simon, the zealot. And Jude. He was the treasurer for the group. He got to an argument about money before he identified uh, Jesus to the soldiers of the Sanhedrin. And before I go to what that is, let me just say this. Uh, I want to point this out because I read this a while back and this makes sense, especially toward Judas. Simon the Zealot. Judas also was a zealot. And a zealot was a group of individuals who hated the Romans and wanted to see them overthrown. They were waiting for the Messiah to come and defeat the Romans and take back Jerusalem and Israel and be done with it. So these were individuals who may have done some guerrilla type warfare or problems for the Romans, uh, but they were very zealous in working against the Roman Empire. So that's very important to understand. Now the Sanhedrin, in case you're wondering, was an assembly of either 23 or 71 elders that were appointed to sit as a tribunal in every city in the ancient land of Israel. Now, this was a religious court <laughs> that tried Jews for religious infractions, not criminal cases. Okay? These are uh, infractions against the Ten Commandments or the laws for food or the Sabbath or any of the things that the Myron things that the Jews follow. This was a, uh, the, there were two classes of rabbi, uh, rabbinite Jewish courts, which were called Sanhedrin, the Great Sanhedrin and the Lesser Sanhedrin. Now, I would imagine that the Great Sanhedrin was the court that Jesus was brought to stand trial for blasphemy. That's what he was brought up for. Because he had said that he was Messiah. Keep in mind that Jesus was brought before the court, before this court, that the high priest Caiaphas would have been the top judge. So I, so I think it was probably the, the high sentence. Because we know that Caiaphas was there because he's the one that asked questions and made the uh, charge. This is why they sent Jesus to Pontius Pilate, to stand trial in a Roman court, so the death penalty could be given to Christ. As we know, that is exactly why Pilate did condemn Christ to be crucified, because that's what they wanted him to do. Uh, of course, you know the story. He asked if he should crucify Barabbas or if he crucify Jesus. And the people chose Barabbas. I remember in the, I think, the very first three, we were talking, and I told you that 
Jesus died because of sin. Not because the Jews said Barabbas instead of Jesus. Not because Caiaphas or the Sanhedrin sent him to Pilate. Not because Pilate condemned him to the cross. It was sin. Our sin, period. Nothing else. Now let's see. Okay, just a little bit more. Yes, okay. Just a little bit more about the people who followed Jesus. His early followers. Uh, Matthias was the apostle that replaced Judas. Mark was born in Cyrene, Libya. Means he was a Libyan. He also was the interpreter for Peter and wrote a lot of his letters. Wrote them down as he dictated them, not wrote them for him. And Luke was a doctor. All right, that is where I'm going to leave it. Uh, I want to say something, I may repeat this next. Wednesday as well, but like I told you, that's the way it goes, because I believe that repetition is the mother of knowledge, so if I repeat it, there's a reason, okay? But I wanted to bring this up, because I don't know, uh, I don't know how many people have thought about this, uh, maybe a lot of people that are knowledgeable have, but there are a lot of people out there that don't or haven't, and, I, and I'll tell you this, a person I was talking to one time, and I knew this person very well, we actually worked together, uh, but he popped up one day and said, Jesus didn't die in three days. No, he didn't. And he, he's trying to say that the Bible says, and he was then buried and crucified and uh, arose three days later. That's what he was talking about. He's trying to say that I was saying, and the Bible was saying that he arose three days later. later. That's not what it says. It says he arose on the third day. Now, we don't really know how much time frame that is. I was sitting there thinking about this today. And so I guesstimated about 34 hours. Oh, this is how I come to this, okay? He was taken the night before. He was captured. He was sent to Pilate. He was condemned to die on the cross. He was put in jail. The next morning, he was hauled out and he was beaten. That was taking the punishment for our sins. Then he had part of the cross. That he, that he had to carry, and he was forced to walk to Golgotha, the place where he was crucified. And he was put up on the cross. I, we don't know exactly what time, but uh, they didn't stop for lunch, you know, maybe around 11, 12, put up on the cross. Uh, I think I heard about how long the person could live on a cross, and it was hours, but sometimes more, but it depended. But anyway, anyway, he went up sometime early Friday and he passed away a certain period of time before sundown. Okay? Because if you remember the story, they were very anxious to get him down before the sun went down because that put them in the Sabbath. Remember, for Jews and for Muslims, the Sabbath is Friday evening sundown until Saturday evening sundown. That's the Sabbath day. Okay? 
and they can do nothing. You cannot cook, you cannot prepare food. You can use the toilet facilities, but you can't do anything else. You can't work, nothing, okay? Except rest and worship God, okay? Because that's what it's for. So they had to get him down and into the tomb before that hit, or they would have to stop wherever that was. So they did get him down. They took him into the tomb. They wrapped him in uh, the shroud. He had a, a face shroud around him that, that was very common in that time. When a person died like that, they would cover their face with a cloth so it couldn't be seen. Uh, and they got him in there. They put him on the slab. They got out. They rolled the stone closed. They did it in time. They got home. Uh, you know, if you, you know, to eat on Friday, you had to spend your time fixing supper Friday night or eat early, breakfast and lunch Saturday, and either uh, have it fixed for an early supper or wait until sundown, and then you could fix supper on Saturday. Okay. So, anyway, uh, so they got him in there. Everything was cool. Uh, they had their Sabbath Saturday. By the time the Sabbath ended, sundown, it's dark. That's sundown. That's why it's dark. The sun went down. So you can't see anything. You can't go out in the wilderness with the animals and stuff right out there. Uh, you can't see anything anyway, especially in a cave. That's dark. There's no electric plates. So they did not go Saturday evening to take it. And besides, with those oil candles or oil lamps, you can't see it enough, well enough to clean the body up. Okay? So first thing Sunday morning, sun up. Uh, Mary, I go headed off with stuff to clean Jesus' body. You know the story. I don't know exactly what time she left, but she got there sometime right around sunup so that she could see. And uh, the big rock door was moved. There was an angel sitting up there and asked if she was looking for her. And when she said, the angel told her that why are you searching here? He's gone. And she went in and looked and saw the slab empty. And she ran back and told the disciples. And when everybody checked it, this is very interesting because this is in the Bible. Okay, this is, this is in there in the New Testament that the shroud was there on the slab, but it was folded. And the face covering was there and folded. Why is that? And why did the Bible mention that? Well, a preacher that said this, and I liked this, said that everything in the Bible is there for a reason. So there's a reason it's there. Okay. But it was folded, but he was gone. And they saw that. So I figured that if uh, he died sometime just before, let's say, 6 p.m., uh, actually, I think I figured it on 7 p.m. Huh? Okay. I think I huh? I think it was 3 p.m. Oh, 3 p.m.? Was it 3 p.m.? Okay. <clears throat> well, that, that changes a little bit. 3 p.m. That doesn't make it. Right. That's according to Mark. According to Mark? Okay. Uh, well, they said that it was not long. Now, now maybe it, um, maybe they met a couple hours. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, so if it's three p.m. according to Mark, uh, well, that would only be three hours before basically sundown. That's about the time. It right? could be as late as six, depending on what you're looking at. Yeah, there's conflicting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't know. That's the thing. I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. This is all I'm guessing. Okay, but that that's fine. That just uh, that just adds a couple more hours to to what I had looked at. Uh, so, 
So let's go from uh, three. And so that would be, let's say, let's say 6 p.m. possibly. Uh, that 6, 6.30 p.m. Sun went down. So that's roughly three hours. Okay. And then I had figured from seven or four. So I figured from 7 p.m. Friday night until 7 p.m. Saturday night was 24 hours. And then 7 p.m. Saturday night to midnight is five hours. Okay. So that's 24, 29 hours, right? I did my math right. And then we add the four, that's 33 hours. Now, I don't know what time he was raised. That is known by no one but God. Right. I mean, okay. We don't know that. Okay. So, uh, but I'm saying that he had to be out of there before sunset or sun, sun up, before sun up. Okay. So if we're, you know, if I say 6 a.m., Okay, uh, so let's say sometime before five, you know, we're only talking about 39 hours. We're not talking about three days, 72 hours. That's the only point I want to make to you. So think about that, you know. He was raised on the third day. Okay, we're gonna leave it there. We'll pick it up next uh, Wednesday night where I left off. Uh, just to let you know, again, I messed up and forgot to plug the dog on the computer in, so the battery got two weeks, so it shut off, and that's why we lost it. But Dave is, Dave is going to uh, take the first part that we started today and the second part when I dip both of them off and he's going to splice them together. You can probably cut out that introduction I made, but I think uh, because I'm doing the same thing now. But uh, he'll splice them together so it'll be spliced into one sometime uh, after Sunday. Maybe uh, maybe he'll be able to get it done by Wednesday, next Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. by next Wednesday. And so that night when we do the next one, and he's going to make sure I plug the computer in. Then that night, I or that night or the next morning, I will put both of these on YouTube. Right. So you'll be able to see them. And the first one will be pretty much all in one piece without really being able to tell what hour. Okay. And I just want to let you know so that you you are aware. All right. Uh David, please you give us a Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the fact that you gave us your son, Lord, to wash away our sins. Let us understand through this lesson, Lord, that you've provided for us to uh, understand the importance of evangelism, the importance of taking the narrow gate as opposed to, to the wide. Let us apply this lesson to our daily lives in worship and praise of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Outstanding. I uh, hope you'll be with us next week. I hope you will uh, get some stuff out of these. Uh, we're glad to do them. We hope uh, they'll help some people. Uh, we will see you here next Wednesday, same time, same station.